Hi, good afternoon. I've come to talk about uh, scientists. But before I talk about scientists, I want to talk about cars. Please bear with me. When you're stuck in traffic or you're hitting the, the high road and you're looking around and all cars are more or less the same, they are all gray and cars are not very different from them, from each other. But until the day when you buy a car and you buy like a red car and all of a sudden you start spotting all the red cars uh, on the road, and somehow it seems that there are many more red cars than there used to be before you bought a red car. And that's because you have a red car, and a red car becomes something important to you, so you notice all the red cars. And another type of car I wanted to talk to you about are yellow cars. <laughs> yeah. Yellow cars are so different from the rest that it's not possible that you don't notice them. If you, if you have a, a, a yellow car parked or, or on the street, it's not possible not to notice. And this became very handy to me because I have two small kids and road trips can be quite challenging. So we've come up with a yellow car game. So while they're looking out the window, looking for a yellow car, and the first one to spot a yellow car shouts, yellow car! And the person that shouts more times yellow car wins. So while they're looking out the window, looking for a yellow car, they're not asking for the 20th time, are we there yet? So thank you very much for all of you that drive yellow cars. You've saved my day many times. So what's... What's with cars and scientists? Well, it's about our perception of reality, of what we value around us. And like a very nice talk from 2009 about the danger of a single story, the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but they are incomplete. Stereotypes don't tell the whole story. If you look around and you say, Cars are gray. Yeah, most of the times you're going to be right, but not all cars are gray, and not all gray cars are the same. The perception that people have about scientists is something that really interests us in the scientific community. And there was this experiment being done trying to see what the children think when they think about scientists. And so, since children learn how to draw before they learn how to write, they were asked to draw a scientist. From 1966 to 1977, there were 5,000 drawings on Draw a Scientist throughout the United States and Canada. And when we looked at those drawings, we can see that most drawings are male, Caucasian, middle-aged, with white coats, ready to explore the world. So this is the stereotype of a scientist, and this is probably what you thought about when I, when I thought, talked about drawing a scientist. You think about male, white, middle-aged, because that's what comes up mostly in the media, especially between 1966 and 1977. Most scientists people knew of were middle-aged men, whites. And so, 99% of these drawings, 99% were male. All boys drew men, and only some girls drew women. This is really stunning. Uh, recently, another researcher called David Miller, since this draw a scientist is such a powerful tool to get a hand on what do people think, because, you know, children grow up and they get to be adults, just like us, and they take their, many times they take their perceptions of reality. So there were many people repeating this draw a scientist experiment throughout the world, and so there were many scientific papers on that subject. So David Miller, he compiled all those studies, and they come up with 20,000 drawings from 96 to 2015, and what he found out is in that time, the percentage of, of kids that drew women grew substantially. It went up from 1% to 28%. And this is very good, and we are very happy, but we are still not happy enough because there are many more women than that. And the reason why they suddenly started drawing more women is that because we got more women scientists in the media and more women scientists re 
relating to, to, to children and to other people. So me, as a science communicator, I try to translate the world of scientists to the non-scientists. This is my life's work, and I've divided this into two parts. One, I help scientists to talk better about their work, because if some of you have listened to scientists, you know that sometimes you go like, what? Yeah. So my idea is to make them, when they talk, people go like, wow, instead of what? So this is, this is one point. And the second thing is if scientists, when they talk, people go like, wow, so we have to create opportunities for them to talk with the people. One of the things I did when I was a researcher, I went to talk to schools. In my research institute, there was this scientists go to school program. And I said, I, I, I will go to a school, I'll go to one of the schools. And then they said, well, this is your school, you're going to an elementary school to talk to seven-year-old kids. And I'm like, seven-year-old kids don't know anything about science, why do you want me to talk to them? They, they, they don't even know how to sign their own names. I was really, this is going to be the worst day of my life. And I went there and I talked about bacteria and evolution, and they were the best crowd ever. Ever. They did the most pertinent questions. They, 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 were, they understood perfectly what I was saying, and they did pertinent questions like the scientists in my research institute, and I was really stunned. So seven-year-olds became my favorite crowd. And not only that, in the end, the teacher asked them to give me a drawing, because, you know, they can't write. So they did the drawing, and they gave it to me. And you know what they drew? They drew me. They drew Joana the scientist. It was almost like Anita, also like Marco, but it was me in all kinds of settings. So you see, they drew me with fabulous hair, which I don't have. I wish I did. So I got 100% drawings of female scientists, being the female scientist me. The only difference is that girls drew me with very colorful things like millipedes or... or butterflies or doing vaccines, and boys, they also drew me with fabulous hair that I continue not to have, but they drew me with stuff like dinosaurs or volcanoes, and here I'm analyzing a rock. I did not talk about any of these subjects, so they, yeah, they, I became their red car, so all of a sudden I was a scientist. Their take-home message was, she's a scientist, she can do anything, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> So, this is what happens when you put people, scientists and kids together. They learn that there are more than just gray cars. There are all types of scientists. And I would like, like to talk about three, three stereotypes that we still have in science, and I'd like to talk to you about them, because they really don't tell the whole story. The first one is, of course, gender. This is a very interesting graph because it shows the evolution of the number of scientists in Portugal. And you can see those, that slope over there is the Mariano Gago effect. Mariano Gago was Minister of Science in Portugal, and he really raised the bar and raised the financing of science in this country, which is something absolutely fundamental. If you want to have very good science, you need a lot of scientists, and for that you need money. So he, he managed to put a lot of money into science, and so we have today fabulous science and scientists in Portugal that really, really make us proud. But another thing that really interested me, not only the number of scientists have grown grown so much over the years, I wanted to see how the women and men compare in science. So, as you can see, the evolution of the number of PhDs being defended in Portugal, up until 2008, there were still more men getting their PhDs in Portugal, but nowadays there are more women finishing their PhDs in Portugal, so women are definitely not a red car. We are the gray car, actually. We are half of the gray cars. So it's of no surprise to, to, to us when they came out with this study from OECD that Portugal is the country in the world with more women enrolling in science, technology, engineering, and math courses. Yeah. So yeah, not all gray cars are the same. Some are more gray than others. So it's of no surprise that we have fabulous women. Let me just talk to you about some of the fabulous women we have in science, like 
OK? Elvira Fortunato, she does transistors on papers, microchips. She's changing technology worldwide. She's a wonderful scientist. Also, Zita Martins, she's an astrobiologist. Yes, they're fabulous. Zita Martins, she's an astrobiologist. She's looking for extraterrestrial life in the clues of the molecules that she finds on meteorites and comets that land on the Earth. It's really, really awesome, her work. And also, Isabel Ferreira, she works in Bragança. Yes, they're awesome. And they should all be here with me, and somehow they are. <laughs> Isabel Ferreira, she works in, in Bragança, and she's, she's uh, finding out natural conservatives and colorants from plants and fungi, so we want to change the way we, we do conservation of our food, and she's really, really, really changing that. But of course, we don't have only women in science, we also have some men, okay? So let me just point out some great, like, Otavio Mateus is a paleontologist, is a world-renowned paleontologist. He's already found out a lot of new species of dinosaurs. He's really and also an amazing communicator. And also João Ramai Santos, he works in Coimbra. He's working in stem cell research for the treatment of infertility. And let me finish this with the, this set with Nuno Maulid. Let me stop for a minute at Nuno Maulid. Maybe it's the first time you see it, but Nuno Maulid is really really an extraordinary scientist. When he was 33, he became full professor of chemistry in the University of Vienna. Some of the researchers I've talked to you about have won European Research Council grants, which are very the millionary uh, grants that give people a lot of money to pursue their ideas. Some of them have won one or two. Nunu has won three ERC grants. He regularly published in the highest ranking journals in the world. And not only that, he's only a virtuoso piano player, a concerto piano player. And also that he's an incredibly nice guy. So he's, he's really amazing. But I, I'd like to, to stop and think a bit that he's the only person with dark skin that I've shown you. And this brings me to the, the, to the story of the yellow cars. One day, I entered my research institute, and there was something off. And I couldn't quite pinpoint why. And there are 500 people working in my research institute. And then I figured out what it was. It was the first time I saw a dark-skinned researcher in my research institute. And I was ashamed that that was a yellow car for me. I was really ashamed. How come this exists? So I'd like to talk to you in science about ethnic minorities. We don't have numbers in Portugal, but we have numbers from the United States. And it's really overwhelming, the over-representation of white people and the under-representation of African Americans in, in the United States. We don't have numbers in Portugal, but you just enter research institutes and you just look around and you see there is an under-representation. And science needs variety. What we've learned from Darwin is is that evolution needs variety. We need a lot of people with different ideas and different backgrounds so we can have great teams and not everyone thinking the same way. It's really important to have diversity. So it, was, it is with great pleasure that we have in Portugal this program, this PhD program that is run by Joana Sao on the far right for, from you. She's a researcher uh, now at, uh, at uh, the, the economic uh, faculty. And she came up with this PhD program designed to bring to Portugal and bring to research institutes people from the African-speaking countries. And they are, they are putting out there every year 20 people that are being uh, formed as researchers and then they continue their research with us, which is really, really important. We need diversity. We need diversity. I don't want these people to be our yellow cars. So the last point I want to point out is age. Most people think, well, scientists have been scientists all their lives. You, you just you go to the university, you do a PhD, you always do science, you are extremely focused, you never do anything else. Well, I mean, let me talk to you about someone you already met today. Let me talk to you about Joaquim Gaspar. He's male, he's Caucasian, he's middle-aged, but he's nothing nothing but a stereotypical scientist. He did 40 years as an officer in the Navy, working in the Navy. So when he retired, over 50 years of age, when he retired, he decided he wanted to be a scientist. So he enrolled in the faculty here around the corner, and he went there and he did a PhD. And he had such good ideas. 
he brought know-how that no other scientist in the faculty has. So he had a burning question. So he thought, maybe I can apply to European research grant that has the starting grants that give you money if you have a great idea worth pursuing. So he applied, and he won. He won 1.2 million euros because he has a great idea. It's really, really, really awesome. So the thing is, next time you are stuck in traffic, look around. Not all cars are gray, and not all gray cars are equal. If you want to be a scientist, don't let anybody tell you you can't be a scientist because you have the wrong gender, you have the wrong background, you come from the wrong place, you come from the wrong city, or you're, you're not young enough. Don't let anybody tell you which path you should choose. If you have curiosity and you have perseverance, that's what makes a scientist. Most like the seven-year-olds that drew me with fabulous hair. So thank you very much.